coming to Woodward Sports. Woodward and Main Street. The Woodward Sports Network Detroit Lions Show. Let's go! Catch Gabrielle D. Phillips, Matt Broder, and Terry Foster for all the latest news on your Detroit Lions every week. Only on the Woodward Sports Network YouTube channel and woodwardsports.com. Good morning and welcome back to episode two of Woodward and Main Street, the Woodward Sports Lions Insider Show. How are you doing this morning, Matt Broder and Terry Foster with me, Gabrielle D. Phillips. I'm doing well, Gabby. How are you? I'm doing good. Bright and early. Thanks for joining us. We're a little bit late today, but nevertheless, we have lots to get into. Terry, how you doing? Doing fine. I told you the Lions were a real football team. Oh, yeah? You I said it. Say that. I'm pretty sure uh, uh, you two both picked the Chiefs. We'll pick the Chiefs to win. I got to slide that in there right at the beginning of the stream. Calling, calling us out already. I have to. Calling me out. I know what I did, but you know what? I will say I picked the Chiefs, but I was hoping that the Lions would prove me wrong. I can appreciate that. I was hoping the Lions would prove me wrong. We're going to (laughs) kick things off here uh, with a few few little whisperings around the media that I want to start off with. So we have Colin Coward saying last night, that's the kind of game that the Detroit Lions have lost my entire life. And then continue to say the Detroit Lions are him. Tough, physical, passionate, caring, and perfect. But God, they really care. Pat McAfee said, you Lions fan deserve this moment. You Lions fans have sat through so much bad football. The fact that you are now in a position where last night was expected has to be absolutely glorious. And then Stephen A. Smith rounding it out saying, this guy, Dan Campbell, we've got to give him some love. Whatever it is about him has really, really changed the culture and makeup of the team. And closing it out, Mike Florio said, the roar has been restored. I mean, can you believe that these are quotes about the Detroit Lions? Can you believe that the Lions went out there and made what so many thought Impossible you know happen. What? That's all fine and dandy, but did you see the official NFL standings? They had the Lions at zero and zero because that was an asterisk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're so definitely they didn't, count, they didn't count the win. We're definitely going to get into that later in the show because Terry might have predicted that. But we have to cover off last episode. We closed out going over the optimistic and the pessimistic. So Terry had said for the optimistic that they're a legit football team. The message is clear that they need to prove something. So my question is, did they prove that something to you, Terry? Uh, In the euphoria of watching them win, yes, they did. But I kind of, I feel I have a different feel right now. Because Mm -hmm. I think if uh, Kelsey had played, Kansas City would have won. Because, A, he doesn't drop passes. Patrick Mahomes wouldn't have gone to those other scrubs. They kept dropping passes. So I think he was a very key member of that. But, you know, once again, in the NFL, there are no asterisks. You either win or you lose. Uh, so, uh, that, you know, that that is my feeling on that whole thing. How about you, Matt Brother? Yeah, you know, in the past, they, they, they would lose a game like that. It was a, a relatively ugly game. There were mistakes made. It was the first game of the season, but... The, the word that kind of defines them that Dan Campbell uses so often is grit. And they, it was a gritty game that they just etched out. They, 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 they exerted their physical presence with the offensive line with David Montgomery, which is something I don't remember seeing out of a Lions team growing up. So it was refreshing to see that they showed up. They showed up in primetime. Dan Campbell had them ready to go. Um, he sort of answered all those final question marks that, that I had. I mean, what really made me nervous as like a Lions fan growing up that you said is when Mahomes, they ran down the clock, Mahomes gets the ball back, they make it happen, they get the ball back, and then you're like, okay, there's like two minutes left. Please don't screw it up. When when Dan Campbell went for it on fourth (laughs) down near midfield, the old Lions was giving up a touchdown in like three or four plays. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But, you know, there was something significant that happened when it was fourth and 20. The old Lions would have gone into – a three-man rush, and then drop everyone back. Mahomes will look over the field for like 15, 20 seconds, find somebody open. Wouldn't have gotten the first down, but he would have gotten it, made an 18-yard gain. It would be fourth and two. Then they would have converted, and then they would have scored. Without a doubt. But then they brought the heat. They brought in five guys. Uh, uh, Kansas City offensive lineman jumped. because He's like, oh, my God, look at these guys. They're about to come and kill us now. But um, – 
that was a difference with the Lions. Stay aggressive right into the end. And the fact that the Chiefs knew they weren't getting the ball back. They didn't want to give the ball back to the Lions and, and risk them just overpowering them, just running it with Montgomery and running the clock out. That's that's something the Lions haven't been in that position in a while either. And you saw the defeat on Kelsey's face during that. Just the absolute defeat. And you see Mahomes and Kelsey just standing there and being like, I imagine the internal monologue was. Oh, yeah. The Detroit Lions just beat us when we unveiled our Super Bowl banner. Yeah, you could read it in Kelsey's mustache. You could see the failure. I don't think you could. You have much to say, Matt Brody. The mustaches speak to each other. It's, it was one of those I think, things. I think he had to shave his mustache. I think so. It, yeah. It's their playoff facial we'll hair. I guess we'll see. No, he said he's going to keep the mustache until they lose. And they lost. There we go. So we're going to get on to the pessimistic. Matt mentioned that Andy Reid was 9-1 and one in home openers was was nine and one <laughs> in home openers but i also want to point out that mahomes had not lost a single game home opener in his entire career as a starter so he was five and oh with the chiefs two and oh with texas tech and two and oh in high school in white house texas and the lion said oh an experience that you have not had here you go here you go patrick serve it up on a silver platter yeah <laughs> Thoughts? I, I, I think the thing you have to worry about, mm -hmm. if you want to worry, is that that Lions offense that we all predicted and, and saw was like number one through five in the league, look a little stale. And uh, they weren't fresh. They weren't crisp. Now, they were able to control clock at the end, which is very important. But I didn't see them putting up 30 points uh, against Kansas City. And, and a lot of it, Kansas City does have a good defense, but some of it, was the fact that the Lions did look stale. They looked out of sync. So that's probably a pessimistic thing there. And when one thing I noticed, when Jameer Gibbs was out of the game, and he didn't get a ton of snaps in, in Thursday's game against the Chiefs, when he seven wasn't carries, in the game. I think it was. Pardon? Seven carries, I think it seven was. Seven carries and maybe yeah. two catches. But it seemed like when he was off the field, the Lions offense lacked – an explosion factor they mm -hmm. lacked someone that it, not just a deep threat but that can threaten you on the outside it it, it makes me think that you know with with it with a major injury if i'm in raw were to have to miss a game if gibbs were to have to miss a game how are they going to deal with that of just just being that ground and pound team without anything on the outside until jamison williams gets back but again we're nitpicking it was it was an ugly first game but they managed to get the job done but i think personally i kind of expected that because your starters that starting core did not get a single snap in the preseason True. so they had a little rust to you know dust off of themselves and i think you definitely saw that in that first drive yeah and they just continued fortunately they've got smart smart coordinators and a smart mm -hmm. head coach that knows their strength and just they, they continue to run it behind that offensive line it was the first game that they played all together as a unit of five and those five guys played 100 percent of their 70 offensive snaps so pretty Pretty impressive stat for, for all five of those guys, especially considering Taylor Decker was a little injured in the first quarter, mm -hmm. uh, but managed to power through it and get through the game. But that's some of those unknowns that you can't plan for, and that was another one yes. of the things that you mentioned with the pessimistic. Obviously, you had mentioned it in terms of Kelsey and Jones both being out and not knowing what Andy Reid was going to do, what they were going to cook up behind the scenes, what other pieces that they were going to use to fill in those holes. But I think really the big unknown factor that we had in this game was that the refs were not going to call out Juwan Taylor the whole night. <laughs> Have the you ever night. seen anything like that, Terry? Never. But I'll tell you what, the Lions have lost. Oh, my God. That would just be dominant talk here in this city. Thank God they won. Seriously. But then you have Dan Campbell, who in his press conference was honestly very positive about it. Uh, because I believe that he can't say much about it yeah. because he's been told he can't talk about the refs. But this was Dan Campbell's quote. The officials are going to call all or not call what they're going to do. Every crew is different, and they decided that they aren't going to do this, and we've just got to play by the rules. So we're going to go with it, and we've just got to adjust. There that word is again, adjust. They just had to adjust for what is being thrown at them, and obviously you can't plan for well, refs not calling You know calling what, and that's very smart because the old Lions, if – somebody was doing something that was illegal or immoral and immoral they'd be like oh my god look what they're doing and it would freak them out they mm -hmm. just played through it and said okay they're gonna do this we're gonna have to adjust and that's what they did do you finally. think aiden hutchinson adjusted to that well 
Yeah, I, I mean, Aiden Hutchinson had a great game. He, yes. he didn't fill up the stat sheet. He didn't get any sacks, but he was in the backfield all night long, making it tough on Juwan Taylor and, and Patrick Mahomes. And although Mahomes, being the incredible quarterback he is, was able to elude some of some of that pressure and sneak through the middle of the line, mm -hmm. um, Aiden Hutchinson had himself a game. So you wonder if Juwan Taylor wasn't breaking the rules could he have had two, three sacks? Who knows? He did still impact the game. Aiden Hutchinson, he, he had himself a game. Yeah, sometimes you just can't look at how many sacks somebody has who's an edge rusher and say, mm -hmm. well, he had a good game or he had a bad game. He put pressure on Mahomes. He, uh, you know, hit him a couple of times. He made him scramble. Yeah. And so Patrick Mahomes, a guy who is very difficult to sack, what you want to make him, there's no staff for this, is – Un, an uneasy stat. How many times do you make him feel uneasy during the game? And I would say probably Hutchinson made him feel uneasy like at least seven or eight times. I would agree with you. And I think across the board, he was one of the most impressive players out on the field during that game to get that Lions win. And I don't think it's all just about the stats and the amount of sacks that he gets. I think it's about the overall, you know, pressure he's adding on that field. And I think you said, you know, with those additions that we've had that we've talked about, it's nice to see those that were on the team last year continue to step up. And we mentioned it in the first episode that Hutchinson put on that weight over the summer, that you were going to see him improve when he got out on the field. And I think he's already proved that in game one. Yeah, and you look at, uh, I think Ali McNeil was maybe the highest rated PFF player, defensive mm -hmm. player in the game. Take PFF for, for what it is. That the defensive line played well. Again, like the, the stats didn't didn't necessarily show, but like Terry said, it's not just about those stats when you're looking at a defensive line to to contain a quarterback, to make it hard on him, and, and to force difficult throws that, that the secondary, you know, was able to take advantage of. Well, I got to bring up my boy now. Bring okay. him up. The one that everybody hates, Alex Anzalone. He's the guy that the fans are like, oh, he's a scrub, he's no good, he's slow, he's whatever. All I know is the Lion coaching staff of all the linebackers, he played the most snaps. So the coaching or the coaches must see something in Alex Anzalone that the rest of y'all don't see. I, I like him as a player. Yeah. He is not Ray Lewis, but he's effective. He does his thing. He gets his nose and stuff, and he disrupts plays. And when he plays, they win. The coaching staff trusts him, whether it's Kelvin Shepard, the linebacker coach, or Dane Campbell, everyone on that team, his teammates trust him. We were talking a little bit before the show. I, I think of Alex Anzalone now as like the Jared Goff of the defense. They've they've mm. talked about him. Uh, Dane Campbell has said he's the quarterback of that defense, and he might not do anything that wows you. His talent might not, you know, uh, um, jump off the, the screen at you, but he does the little things right. He, he's, he, he directs his teammates. He's always in the right position. So they know this coaches have no, they need intangibles like that. You got the athleticism with Jack and Malcolm and, and Derek Barnes. They need that stable force wearing the green dot in the middle. And Alex Anzalone is someone they trust and rewarded with a three-year contract this, this off season. So he's not there. They didn't draft Jack Campbell to replace Alex Anzalone. They Correct. drafted him to play alongside Alex exactly. Anzalone. Now, so, young Matthew, I'm trying to educate you, young man. Let's hear what it. What must you have on defense in order to win? A blonde ponytail. You have to have a white guy with a blonde ponytail <laughs> to win in the National Football League. It's true. Look it up. And there you have it. It's and true. Anzalone Lions does have that. that. <laughs> the Lions got that. So Super Bowl gonna... contenders because of that. We'll see. Well, we'll see. We'll get into that early. talk a Too little bit later in the that. show. We'll see. But a little bit more on Anzalone and the players that made it possible for the Lions to beat out Kansas City in game one of the NFL season. We'll be right back. Woodward Sports own Tom Mazaway and Sam Stick Day will be hosting our Lions postgame show after every Lions game all season long. Tune in to the Woodward Sports YouTube channel for his hot off the press takes, game analysis, and Kool-Aid sipping celebrations. You won't want to miss it. Join Maz, Stick, and special guests each week immediately following every Lions game exclusively on the WSN YouTube channel. Join Woodward Sports' own Jeff Iafrady, along with special WSN guests for the most anticipated Lions season in decades. Filled with different surprises and expert analysis. You're not going to want to miss out. Go to our Woodward Sports YouTube channel on Sundays and tune in live from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. 
we are back and we've got to talk about these players that made it possible for the Detroit Lions to win this game. I'm Gabrielle D. Phillips, Matt Broder, Terry Foster. This is Woodward and Main Street, your Woodward Sports Lions Insider Show here bright and early on Tuesday and Sunday mornings to recap and then get you ready for your next Lions game. So kicking things off, most impressed. I have a feeling that we're going to all want to pick the same exact player. So I'm going to go first so that I can say it Are first. you kidding me? <laughs> I'm going to go last. Okay. All right. We can pivot. So mine is Brian Branch, who Terry picked and I picked last week as one of our highlight players. And then Matt mentioned that he wanted to pick him as well, but, you know, switched it up for the sake of switching it up we, for we the show. Let him. No, we wouldn't let him. And I did pick two. So, again, I'm, I'm, I think eh, I might fair. be cheating a little bit, but... Wow. I mean, picking off Mahomes in your first NFL game in Arrowhead is something that I don't think that we can understate at all whatsoever. And that was really the turning point of the game Without for me. I mean, they're trailing by 14 to 7. He gets out there and we really needed as Lions fans something to re-energize us, but I also think the team needed something to re-energize them and give them a little faith that they can they can make this run happen. They can do this. It is possible. You are Lions, but it is possible. And, I mean, I think he was delivering on angry runs. I mean, hitting and spinning like nothing else. Yeah, he was incredible. And, and the thing, everything you said is 100% correct. The, the additional thing I take away from that play is if that ball wasn't tipped up in the air for the interception, he was in the right position to come up and make the tackle before the first down. So just to, just to know that you have such a reliable rookie nickel safety rookie defensive back he can play all over the field it's got to be such an amazing feeling for that coaching staff for aaron glenn the defensive Absolutely. coordinator now, yes it was tipped young man but he also had to adjust his body grab the ball the ball was behind him. yeah yep. grab it like a loaf of bread and bring it in that's not an easy thing to do his body was going one way but he had to adjust and get it so that was a great play by yeah. Brian branch and you know apparently on that play after he caught it and sprinted to the end zone, I think he was recorded as the fastest player in the entire game. It was like really? 20.7 miles per hour or something on that I interception. Like pretty, pretty impressive. You see him running, he was like, this is my chance. Get me in the end zone. Get me in there. <laughs> I can't imagine what that feeling must be like, like just seeing an open end zone and all the fans up there and not one person in your way from getting that first touchdown. Exactly. Gotta be a crazy feeling. Well, he would have been pissed if he was tripped up at the two. Oh yeah, a little, or a Leon Lett just kind of drops it. Right. Drops it right before the end zone. Brian. Matt now, Broder. I know you're waiting for my guy. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm going to go with BB. Blonde bombshell. Blonde bombshell. <laughs> Not uh, Brian Branch. Blindbacker. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the coaches played Anzalone for a reason. Um, he played well. Um, but all kidding aside, yeah, it should be Brian Branch because – when you play football, you have a bunch of guys who can play the game. They're players. But what you need in order to be better than the opponent is a playmaker. Brian Branch, the other BB, was a playmaker. He didn't just make tackles. He didn't just do yeoman's work. He, wasn't, he didn't just fill his gaps. He made a play. Um, so if you look at um, the NFL, is so simple. If you don't turn the ball over, you win. You turn the ball over, you lose. But if everybody is equal as far as uh, turnover margin, you got to find a guy that's going to make a play. Normally, it's a quarterback. Normally, it's a six foot four wide receiver. But in this case, it was the other BB, Brian Branch. He made that play. He was the playmaker that turned a excited sideline into euphoria. Absolute so, insanity broke loose. Yeah, when you when you put emotion in the game, that's huge. That turned everything. Turned everything. That moment. It it was like Gabby said. It was looking like keep, the Chiefs were going to take that next step. They were going to go up twenty one to fourteen, or just mm -hmm. continue to extend the lead. And you're right. He just completely shifted the momentum. And it really turned up, turned up the volume of the Honolulu Blue that was in Arrowhead. Yes. We have to talk about that because that might be the most impressive thing of the game is the amount of Honolulu Blue in Arrowhead. And I mean, at the end there with all the Kansas City fans leaving, it almost seemed 
from some of the camera angles that they were at Ford Field. I know they were not. They were oh, did you see Brad Holmes? Oh, he was Brad loving Holmes it, soaking it all monster. up. As he should soak that all yeah, up. Yeah, I know. He was shaking everybody. Oh, he wasn't shaking hands. He was slapping hands. So he's going up and down the sideline. And thank goodness now, it wasn't Sheila, right? No, it wasn't Sheila. No, he's going <laughs> to kill Sheila one day. I, I, he's, she, no, no. May not kill her, but he's going to break her back one day. Mm. So Sheila, if I was Sheila Hamp, I would invest in a wheelchair because <laughs> Brad Holmes is going to put you in that wheelchair with those big back slaps. So be careful. Most impressive for you, Matt Broder? I'm going to go a little different direction. I'm going to go with David Montgomery slash the offensive line, but I'll focus on David Montgomery. As your second choice behind Yeah, Brian you Branch. got to pick two the first day. <laughs> I'll, I'll go with two here. And, and I'm doing this because, to me, David Montgomery was, was as advertised. When we were down at training camp this offseason, we didn't really get to see them go full 100% uh, uh, hitting, especially when they're doing inner squad. They don't really take take 100% of their energy out on their own team's defense. So yes. I was really looking forward to see what David Montgomery would look like and, and the physicality that he would bring to that offense. And I think it was 21 carries for 74 yards. He he displayed that physical uh, uh, dominance even behind that offensive line to just continue to let the Lions pound the ball forward, continue to eat up that clock and keep the ball out of Patrick Mahomes' hands. So. I, I love what I saw out of David Montgomery and, and that offensive line. He really helped run down that clock. I, yes. I don't know what would have happened in a situation where he wasn't there, how they would have pivoted, like we said, how they would have adjusted. He was a key player in that game, no doubt. Yeah. Terry? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull a Gabby. Okay. okay. I know you told me to pick one, but okay. I'm going to pick five. Oh. <laughs> Montgomery, the offensive line, and the secondary. But – Staying by the rules. I'm not going to be like Gabby who can <laughs> pick six or seven things when you tell her to pick one. <laughs> I'm going to stick with the secondary because early on, there were plays that Mahomes made, and when there was receivers were actually catching the ball, you saw the Lions secondary like, what the hell is going on here? They were confused, and they were questioning each other. They were barking at each other. But then that disappeared. Uh, I have seen Lion teams – when the secondary or unit is barking at each other early in the game, it lasts the entire game. But they got their stuff together. They figured things out. Of course, the Kansas City receivers started dropping passes. But the receivers, I'm sorry, the secondary started to play better because their communication was better. And that was important. Without a doubt. You think about the, the veterans that they added to the secondary, and they were right in the middle of everything when you talk about C.J. Gardner-Johnson and mm -hmm. Cam Sutton. Like, those are the guys that when things break down, when miscommunications happen, which they do, especially in the first game of the season, you've got those guys, the right voices, to sort of calm the, calm the rest of their teammates, the rest of the secondary down, and, and get back to what their game plan was. And I think that might almost fall under that next category that we have of most improved. And that doesn't just fall under, like – the most improved from game to game, but that's a positive most improved. But I, I'm yeah. going to lead off with a negative needs to improve. Let's hear it. Before this next game, and I'm going to go with Marvin Jones Jr. Okay. I don't think he was as helpful as people were expecting him to be in this first game. I'm going to keep it positive. Obviously, this is his first time back on the field as a Lion, but that – Red yeah. zone fumble cannot happen. I know somebody forgot to tell Marvin Jones that the old lines are dead because he was playing like he was a, a member of the 1999 Lions or the 2006 Lions or the 0 and 16 Lions. He didn't get the memo that hey, it's different around here, fella. You're supposed to make plays now, not mess things up. He, he still does seem like a, a, a player that Jared Goff, that the offensive coordinator, Ben Johnson, trusts. And yeah. although the, the, the fumble was unfortunate, and I'm, I'm sure he would say the same thing. Exactly. He was in the right spot very often. He's a, a reliable receiver. We saw Josh Reynolds come up clutch. And although 100%. it wasn't Marvin Jones this game, that's the type of role he plays. He's going to be in the right spots. And that's, that's his first fumble of his career. That's not going to happen again. Do we equate that to the rust from no snaps during the preseason? That could definitely be a he, I mean, he's rusty, too, and that, that's not uh, about his age, just in terms of getting the, the proper amount of work in the, in the offseason. He, uh, he may not have. This, this, is, this is the first game. Everyone's working out the kinks. It's unfortunate to him that it, it was a big fumble that, that was seemingly uh, on its way to alter the game, but 
hey, his brothers picked him up. And I mean, we saw that on both sides because the whole Russ conversation, I guess, also applies to Juwan Taylor with his yeah. injury keeping him out of the preseason. But who do you think needs to see? Who do you need to see the most improvement of? Yeah, so the next game? I, I we already touched on it. I, I had a, a little note, just the overall communication, particularly in the secondary. I I think they showed improvement in in during the game, yes. throughout the game. Um, but I'll go a different route. And it's not because, again, it's not because he played a bad game. He didn't fill up the stat sheet. But I was expecting a little more out of Edge Charles Harris. Um, okay. There's been a lot. He was just named captain. There's been a lot of a lot of new hype surrounding him as sort of a revitalized piece to this defensive line. And it just didn't seem like he made as much of a difference in the game. He, he had some good plays and he was in the backfield. But I don't know. I just wanted to hear his name called more. I wanted to see a little bit more. And I, I do believe that's going to come. I, I've liked what we've seen down, down in Allen Park. But, you know, again, this is nitpicking. Just from the first game, I think he could maybe – um, maybe step it up a little bit. And it's tough to compare captain performances when you have someone like Jalen Reeves Maben that makes such that an incredible play. play as a captain and really shows out and shows the NFL this is why he is the captain. So you want to see everyone who has that C on their chest to kind of step up to the plate. Yeah. So more to come from him. Terry, anyone that you want to see improve by the next game? Well, obviously, uh, Marvin Jones Jr. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Can't fumble, can't make mistakes. He's a veteran. I don't buy the whole, oh, well, he didn't play. You know, he's a vet. Veterans, you know what you do with the veterans in the preseason? You rest them. Yeah. You make sure their bones are working well. I, I, you know, he, if you ask him, he probably feels he doesn't need as much work as a younger guy. So, um, definitely, he's got to get out of the same old Lions mode into the brand new Lions mode because, you know, the brand new Lions don't make silly mistakes. The penalties were down. They didn't turn the ball over. Uh, yeah, it was boring. But boring wins. W. Right. W. Yeah. And you touched on it earlier, Terry, but I want to bring back up the conversation of Anzalone because he's been getting a lot of negativity. But let's just look at some of his stats from this game. Six tackles, five solo, one quarterback hit, one pass defense. And for his 18th straight game, so it's not just this game that he's kind of sparking up. 18th straight game with five or more tackles. Why is he receiving this negativity? You know why? Because he's slow and he's white. <laughs> People don't, they don't understand that a slow white guy can still be effective out there. Um, they don't trust him, uh, but he makes plays, but he doesn't get credit for them, um, it, you know, it, in the public. He's not Ray Lewis. He's not going to have five sacks and he's not going to have 30 tackles or anything like that but he affects a game in a very subtle way that's Could, why couldn't say it any any better, better myself he's that guy who's reliable and they trust to to run the defense be the quarterback of the defense so he's just someone that people are going to pick on for all the reasons terry said i'll just uh, i'll leave it at that you leave it with, you'll leave it with terry yeah you'll leave it with terry all right slow white guy i'll say it yeah <laughs> we're gonna get into your questions sure. what does this make the lions super bowl contenders we're gonna get in a little bit of the fourth down talk and kelsey and jones missing that factoring in and the uh eight drops by the chiefs so we'll get into that and more in a little bit. See you back here soon. Join Woodward Sports' own Jeff Iafrady, along with special WSN guests, for the most anticipated Lions season in decades. Filled with different surprises and expert analysis. You're not going to want to miss out. Go to our Woodward Sports YouTube channel on Sundays and tune in live from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. Brace yourselves, Detroit. As the sun begins to set, two of Woodward Sports' brightest young stars will be taking the mic for a brand new show. Woodward Nights with Spooner and Broder. The dog days in Detroit are over, and the boys are unleashed. Join in on the banter and hop on the bandwagon of the number one night show on the internet. Tune in to the Woodward Sports YouTube channel every weeknight from 8 to 10 p.m. Woodward Nights with Spooner and Broder. Good morning, bright and early. Welcome back to Woodward and Main Street, your Woodward Sports Network Lions Insider Show. I'm Gabrielle D. Phillips. Alongside me, Matt Broder and Terry Foster. We're happy to have you here this morning with us recapping the Detroit Lions and Kansas City Chiefs' first game of the NFL season, the biggest game 
in Detroit Lions history, which I think is even more relevant now, Terry. It's the biggest opening game okay. in Detroit Lions history. I think winning a playoff game in 92 was a little bit bigger. Okay. And, uh, and, and there'll be bigger games this season, hopefully, if they keep winning. But um, there has never been an opener that has created this much excitement that was so important for the uh, Lions that's created a talk that I've never heard in this city before. Now, here's the key. You always have to validate. Now, Seattle just got their asses handed to them by the L.A. Rams. I don't like playing teams like that because Seattle's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder. It's like they have nothing to lose. And uh, so that could be a tough game. It's, it's, it's going to go one of two ways. Seattle's going to come in here all pissed off and say, okay, let's spoil the Lions Sunday home opener. Or maybe Seattle just sucks. And so they'll come in here and just get beat by three or four touchdowns. So we need to see. So, um, but the Lions of old would beat Dallas on a Monday night game and then the next week lose against Tampa at home or something yeah. silly like that. So now they have to validate against Seattle. Yeah, this is test number two for Dan Campbell and the coaching staff. Can you get your guys ready now that you're going to be favored in this game? Seattle had a tough opener uh, where they did not play well. Can you get your guys in that mindset to remind them of what Seattle did to you in your building last year? Not having given up a punt to them um, is one of those things you got to have your boys ready to go. So we'll see from Dan Campbell and team this uh, this Sunday too. Definitely. So and he did mention that, which was smart. And I'm sure he's mentioned it to his players. I know you beat Kansas City, but you didn't beat the Seattle team. They came into your house and trucked you. Yes. But what I did like from Dan Campbell coming off the field and having that interview right as they won, he did say that, you know, we're going to enjoy this for two or three days, which they should. And, you know, I've been hearing a lot of talk that it's really positive that he said that because it's not just like get back to work. No, this is a big deal for the Lions, and they should enjoy this moment. And then they should take that enjoyment and apply it to the next game. Remember how this feels, and now make that feeling happen again at home for these fans that flew all the way out to Kansas City and shelled out a lot of money to see you yes. play at Arrowhead. Now let's make that happen at home. Let's make that happen Dude, in the you Lions' know what else home team said? We got a lot to clean up. Yep. In other words, you can enjoy this for 24 hours, but, we but then get we'll get your to work. back to work because we got some problems. Which was something said across the board because Dan Campbell mentioned that and then also Jared Goff in his interview had mentioned that. And what did you hear down at Allen Park yesterday, Matt? From from Dan Campbell? Yes. Uh, it was Similar? That, it was that same message. All right, we're, we're now back. We got practice. We have a full week to get ready at Seattle. Yeah. Um, we, we need to bring our A game again. We can't take a we, – we don't have a bye week coming up on Sunday. We got to play better than we did against the Chiefs to, to keep the momentum going. To keep that – to get that up to two and zero with no asterisk, which I have to play a little video here, have Parker play a little video for us because last week in episode one, Terry may or may not have called out foreshadowing of something that was going to happen. I mean, Mike Tarico, what was he thinking? Did he think that the Lions fans were gonna be happy with that, Terry? No, absolutely, and Mike Tarico should know better. He lives around here. He knows what lion, what ticks off Lion fans. He knows what uh, people are said, you know, what people say about the Detroit Lions, about any Detroit sports teams. So for Mike Tirico to say that, that shocked me. I can understand somebody else, but not him. Parker, is that ready up there? Awesome. One second. Well, I think we can get a little bit into, we'll get that video up there in a little bit, but let's talk about Dan Campbell and his calls ballsy ballsy calls <laughs> and does this add into the conversation about the lions being super bowl contenders can he make these kinds of calls and still be in the conversation as super bowl contenders i think so and i think this is part of what what makes dan campbell dan campbell um and, and whenever you you had that video go ahead and play it and we'll get back to the conversation but but his ability to to gain the trust of his team where they, they know he's going to make calls like this. He talked about preparing for calls like this with special teams uh, coach Dave Phipp uh, in his press conference yesterday. It, it, 
the aggressive mentality is part of his game plan. It's part of what, what they prepare for each week. So the guys love to see it. David Montgomery after that game, when he was when he was asked about the fake punt, he said, hey, we got a ballsy coach, and I love it. And Jared Goff said, yeah, we love it. Backed up, fake punt, pretty ballsy, but it worked. Like, these guys are bought into Dan Campbell and his antics. Parker. Hit it, Parker. You've got that video. My big question is, if the Lions win – versus Kansas City not at full strength, does it still count as a win in your book? Yes. Okay. The NFL, what they do is they have these standings. They have W, L. <laughs> mm. And then they put a, a number by if you went one, two, three. It's not an asterisk or anything like that. What a brilliant young man. <laughs> <laughs> Was that T. Foster Domus? No, you know what? I... I hear this all the time. Whenever a Detroit team does something, there's always somebody who says something like, you didn't deserve it, it was a fluke, or something like that. So Mm -hmm. this is par for the course. This is just the NFL. You have to line up against the team that is across from you. We had people out. Are we going to go and say, well, you know, we didn't win because we have a player, a star player that's suspended? Mm -hmm. No. Gabby, I'm going to make you a guarantee, young lady. Yes. There could be a game where Jared Goff and uh, Armand St. Brown are not playing and the Mm -hmm. Lions are going to lose. Nobody's going to talk about an asterisk if they lose that game. Of course not. Facts. Because it's the Lions. Right. But when it's Kansas City, it's a different different conversation, even though you have a player that's on the sidelines that apparently had a very difficult – it was hard hearing that – hard workout, trying to put weight on his knee – in the pool that morning just hearing that to start the game you're like will travis kelsey come back in this next game who knows tbd lions are lucky enough to get in and get out without him so a win's a win at the end of the season like terry said like terry predicted before the game last season so you got a win or a loss the lines are one and oh and i want to hear your thoughts on jones sitting up in a box with his agents on each side of him how does that look to you, Terry? Uh, it looks like a guy that is entitled. Looks like a guy that wants to get paid. Uh, looks like a guy who's not a team guy. And I'm sure once he's in the locker room, everybody loves him and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But you know, your main thing, focus, should be, of course, taking care of your family. But um, you, should all, you also need to be there for your teammates. Jones knew how important this game was for Kansas City. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that these aren't the scrub lions of, of before, uh, but there's still that mentality in Kansas City that these losing this game was embarrassing. In fact, Patrick Mahomes was asked, were you embarrassed to lose this game? In other words, y'all lost to the Lions. Yeah. They're scrubs. What's, what's wrong with you? So, um, so I don't think Jones took the Lions seriously enough. Maybe Kansas City didn't take them as seriously as they should have. But this is a different team. You're going to have to play. And as a guy that used to go into opposing locker rooms a lot of times, teams didn't, put, take, uh, didn't pay close attention to the Lions. They were like, okay, we're coming in the forward field. We're here to win. And then they, sometimes they'd be losing at halftime and be tied. The coaches were going – Cuss them out. Say, what are you doing uh, still in the game with these guys? And then they would perk it up and then come in the second half and take over. So maybe some of that played out with Kansas City and maybe with Jones where they just didn't take them as seriously as they need to. Well, Kansas City clearly did not take them seriously enough, but you know who will? The Seahawks. And we're going to have a preview for the game on Sunday at 7 a.m., That's it for us now. We'll come back to you. See you on Sunday morning, 7 a.m. Gabrielle D. Phillips, Matt Broder, Terry Foster. This is your Woodward Sports Lions Insider Show. Woodward and Main Street, thanks for sticking with us this morning. Now, coming to Woodward Sports. Woodward and Main Street. The Woodward Sports Network Detroit Lions Show. Let's go! Catch Gabrielle D. Phillips, Matt Broder, and Terry Foster for all the latest news on your Detroit Lions every week. Only on the Woodward Sports Network YouTube channel and woodwardsports.com.